Great, so here we are. They're going to be inspired. This is a fantastic that we have these, uh, these lectures that are giving us an extra dimension of inspiration. And today, in, in the, the President's Lecture Series, we have Paul Chaikin. Chaikin, yeah. sorry, Paul Chaikin. And uh, you're a physicist um, that you will, um, uh, you will, we will also hear about a little bit about your background and story um, then from your host here. But, uh, but uh, you're a physicist and now based in New York University. And uh, the, it's, 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 uh, it's really great that we can have these type of activities here then and also combine it with that uh, you will meet uh, with the, in different constellations with people here at OIST during your time. Uh, and how many days have you stayed here now? Last week. Oh, it's okay. It's, so it's, it's, it's really good to be able to, to stay for a week. You can meet with uh, diff other different type of disciplines, with students, and, and maybe see a little bit of the fantastic inspirational island here. Um, so um, this, the speakers that, uh, that uh, we are inviting for the presidential lectures come, of course, from many different scientific um, backgrounds, and so I just encourage you to think also about who else we could uh, invite going forward, and and so that we can continue and uh, also broaden up and more inspiration for uh, for everybody here at at OIST. So so with that, I think yeah, it's uh, uh, Professor Bandy that has uh, the role of introducing our guest here today. So please. Thank you, President Marketus. So good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for coming. My name is Mahesh. I'm on the faculty here at OIST. Uh, and it's my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Paul Chaikin. Uh, Paul received his uh, PhD from University of Pennsylvania with Alan Heger, Nobel laureate in physics. I believe his PhD to uh, thesis topic was on many, many body problems in superconductivity. Uh, and uh, following his uh, PhD, uh, he started his uh, academic career at UCLA as uh, assistant professor and uh, continued working in superconductivity. But at some point, uh, the lure of actually seeing the microscop mi microscopics of the systems led him to uh, jump to soft matter physics. Uh, and uh, he was one of the founding uh, fathers of uh, an entire sub-branch of soft matter physics we know as colloidal physics. And that has blown up into a, a, a big uh, field. Uh, we have colloidal glasses, crystals, uh, we have all sorts of various uh, phenomena. But Paul has also worked on uh, topology, uh, nanotechnology, uh, polymers, all sorts, all kinds of problems. But the a uh, particular problem he has chosen to work on is a very old one. The question itself took a long time to formally uh, define, I think. But uh, as if you have read his abstract, he refers to uh, uh, Luke from the Holy Bible. But there are references to this problem at, in, in pockets of Japanese history as well. So those of you who have heard of Sangaku, these were wooden uh, tablets with uh, mathematical puzzles that were hung uh, at uh, Shinto and uh, Buddhist temples. One of them refers to a circle packing problem. It's quite famous. And that is related to the topic uh, Paul will discuss today. Another one is uh, uh, found in uh, the Kojiki records. Kojiki literally translates to the book of the ancients in Japan, uh, which discusses the efficient packing of soybeans. Uh, Similar references are found in De Sfera Mundi by Johannes de Sacro Bosco uh, from the 14th century, where he discusses uh, twisted bead Moroccan purses that came from the Maghreb uh, by traders, Moroccan traders into Europe. So there are references to this problem throughout uh, history. And Paul is going to enlighten uh, a definitive aspect of it from an uh, objective uh, physicist uh, standpoint uh, today. So over to you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to thank the president for inviting me and Mahesh for showing me around and seeing what a really innovative, fascinating place for research OIST is. I'm going to talk to you, to give, give the talk today. Oops, if I can find my activator here, um, about an ancient problem, as uh, Mahesh said. Um, 
I'm going to relate it, however, to a model that I invented for a completely different um, problem, um, which has to do with the irreversibility of low, the reversibility of low Reynolds number flow, which we'll get to and talk about. But the model is really simple. I mean, it's simple, it's simple, it's simple enough that I could actually understand it and uh, write it down. So the idea is you throw down particles, and the particles can overlap one another or not. Okay, and if they overlap, they're considered active, and if they're active, they take a random step, irrespe ir irrespective to the uh, step that the, the other pair of the, um, of the overlapping pair is. And this thing progresses, okay, until, as you'll see, uh, it goes to a state where there are no overlapping particles. Okay. And so this is a form of organization that wasn't sort of known before. It's simply taking things where there's a problem and only moving things to solve that problem, only moving the particles that are causing the problem, if you like. And it turns out that will give us some insights, some new insights into this, as we just heard, ancient problem of particle packing. And a typical example of particle packing is shown over here. This is a crystalline packing. This over here is a disordered packing. Both of them sort of coexist in this just heap of particles. Um, and what we're going to find out is that this model over here actually leads um, the highest density you can get with this. Oh, I should have mentioned something. Of course, if I increase the number of particles here, you can all imagine it will get to a stage where I cannot never satisfy everything. And so it will keep on moving, okay, forever. It will reach an active steady state. And there's a transition between the absorbing states where everything stops and where you get this activity. And that's a critical state and it's actually a, um, a dynamical phase transition. And the critical point of that phase transition actually will be something that defines this disordered state over here and gives you, with nothing else than saying I'm looking for the highest density that I can get from this model, gives you randomness, jamming, which Sid could have talked about but didn't really, isotropy, um, which says that all directions, things look the same independent of the direction you look. Isostaticity, which I'll define for you later, but essentially means it's marginally stable. Hyperuniformity, which I'll also define for you later, which means that long range density fluctuations are killed. Um, and it has an upper critical dimension of four, which means anything higher than four dimensions is the same as infinity. Okay? All of them have um, the same behavior. Okay, so the packing problem, the densest packing of spheres, was solved millennia ago, four, five, six millennia ago, as soon as people had fruit. And in backward countries like the United States, our grocers still pack the fruit like this. And so every child knows that the densest packing of spheres is this structure over here, which is called face-centered cubic, and I'll show you why in a minute or so. Okay, and it fills space to 74%, leaving 26% void. Okay? Now the reason I say that's what we learn in the United States is because if you go to a market here, okay, you see the grocers don't pack their fruit that way anymore. Technology has taken over everything here, okay? And so you don't learn as a child that the densest packing is FCC. So it turns out this FCC packing was, um, as I say, it's an ancient problem and people solved it. Grocers knew how to do it a long time ago. It became the Kepler conjecture. In 1611, Kepler said, what's the densest packing I can have for cannonballs on a ship for the Royal Navy? Uh, Gauss showed that if you look only at lattices, FCC is the densest lattice. And the problem after millennia was actually solved, meaning not only did they have a packing that was the densest, but they could prove it was the densest. And that was by Thomas Hales, and it took 
refereeing of the paper took from 1994 to 2018, just the refereeing of the paper, because part of it was a computer proof, and they had several thousand examples, maybe hundreds of thousands of examples, that they had to check individually aside from the proof. Okay? Um, okay. So those problem, that problem is solved. We now know precisely what the densest packing is. Now, in this um, heap of particles that you see here from a paper by Bernal over there, um, you've got this other phase over here, which is disordered. Okay? And it fills space. It's known, Bernal named it, random close packing rather than just close packing. Close packing is the densest packing, and that's this. But the random close packing fills space to 64%. Okay? And its properties are not that well known, and that's sort of what we're going to investigate here. So why are people interested in these problems? Um, well, originally it's because back when, gro when um, grocers were stacking their spheres up, um, instead of selling fruit or beans or whatever, um, by uh, weight, they sold it by volume. So if you could figure out a way to pack less densely, right, you could sell more bushels, you could make more money, okay, you could buy your neighbor's farm, you could become rich, you could do all sorts of things. And that supposedly wasn't good, and that's where this quote comes from about packing of grain, in closing, I must forget the commentary that Mahish um, told you on random packing, which St. Luke attributes to Jesus. Give it shall be given unto you, good measure pressed down and shaken together and running over. Shall men give unto your bosom for the same measure that ye mote with all shall be measured to you again. In other words, don't cheat. Okay? You have to pack it down and make sure it's as dense as you can get it. And of course, nobody really knows how dense that is. Um, now, it's also important for other reasons. One of them is the structure of liquids and solids, and that's what I'm going to talk about here. Um, when people started doing thermodynamics, okay, everybody learned in uh, public school, I think, here, PV is NKT, the ideal gas law, right? And Van der Waals, when he started saying, oh, well, not everything's an ideal gas, we have gases which have interactions between them. Um, he said the first thing you should consider before attractions between the particles is that the particles take up space. So instead of having a volume down here or up there, he says what you really want is the free volume, so it should subtract from that volume the volume of all the spheres, which is just the number of spheres times the volume per sphere. And I can write this in a fashion where it's NKT over V times 1 minus phi over phi C, where that's the critical volume, that's the critical volume fraction, so 74% for the FCC packing and 64% for the random close packing. Okay? And of course, when you're at that, there's no volume, you can't, the particles can't move around, they're all touching one another, they're jammed. Okay? And so the pressure diverges there, and that's what I've shown over here. Um, at that um, volume fraction, the entropy actually goes to zero, and what we want to do is maximize the entropy or lower the pressure, depending on how you want to look at it. And what that tells you is sometime before you get to random close packing, where the pressure diverges, you will be pushed from the disordered phase into the ordered phase, into the crystalline phase over here. So it tells you that the stable state for the system is the crystal rather than the disordered arrangement. And this is a, a very similar problem. And, and what that says is whatever has the highest density, okay, either the crystal phase over here or the disordered phase, if I switch position, then the system would be pushed into the disordered phase. So it's a question now of is the stable phase Disordered or ordered, okay? And everybody's intuition, okay, is that the ground states of system, of systems, are ordered rather than disordered, okay? And the, everybody's intuition as well is that the densest packing is going to be ordered rather than disordered. 
And in fact, nobody has a proof for that. That's very fundamental, but there's no proof for it. And as one of my colleagues said, is the only reason that you accept that is because your mother told you when you were a kid that if you folded up you know, your clothing, you could fit it into your drawer and get more stuff into your drawer you know, when you were packing it. Okay? But aside from that, which is just an intuition, nobody knows. OK, well, we can look at this um, transition which is seeing the pressure looking like it's diverging and then hopping over from a disordered phase to an ordered phase by doing a, a, an experiment which comes directly from one of Einstein's two, uh, nine, 2005, uh, 1905 papers. Okay? In this paper, he's looking at colloids. He says that PV is NKT over here. He's using particles that are not interacting so far, but here's the ideal gas law again. He says colloidal particles are just like particles. They're going to obey the ideal gas law, okay, or something like it. And he tells us something else. He tells us if we want to know what the pressure is, we can integrate the weight of the particles that sit above the level I'm at. That's essentially the same thing as saying is the pressure right here in this room, okay, corresponds to the weight of the, of the weight of all the gas from here up to the end of the atmosphere. Of course, the atmosphere just tails off exponentially. But that's what gives us the pressure in this room, is the weight of the particles above us. So you can do an experiment, and this is an experiment with colloids, and what you find is, here is P over NKT, so, um, and this is the density, or the volume fraction, and what you see is something that looks like it will diverge somewhere over here, although it's hard to really extrapolate that. But what you do see is at this point you jump from a phase which you can look at is liquid-like because it looks milky. These are the colloids. And it jumps to a phase which is colorful. And those colors are a crystallis forming. And the crystal has planes in it, and the planes diffract light. And the wavelength they diffract is like the size of the colloid, which is a fraction of a micron. And that's the, uh, the, color, the wavelength of visible light. So they're Bragg scattering. This is what, if you looked at a piece of um, metal, I don't see any aluminum around, although there must be. Um, if, you see, if you look at a metal and your eyes saw in the x-rays, this is what you would see. You would see Bragg scattering looks like that. So this phase over here, which is right below that line, is crystal. And polyballs is what we call um, col colloids in my lab. OK, so this shows that, that that exists. And all of this comes directly from the fact that the densest packing is crystalline, not random. Uh, OK, now. Um, you can use this some other ways, OK? That form that I showed you, which is the pressure goes like 1 over 1 minus phi c, is useful in other contexts. When I was thinking about this, I happened to go to a Bruce Springsteen concert. And there's a, it was a, is it an auditorium, a basketball court? And so here's the basketball kind of court over here. And here's the, the stage where he was. And people are attracted to Bruce Springsteen, OK? And they're dancing around over here to the music. So there's like pressure, like diffusion, OK? And in fact, sitting back, because we were way in the back you know, with cheap seats, OK, you could see all this motion. And you could see what this profile looked like, OK? And um, you could integrate it up and find the pressure. And what you find is that people pack to 82%. Okay, from the same way that we found from where the divergence um, of the colloids was. Okay, so um, the, as of 1995, there was this phase diagram that people had come up with, which said, okay, sometime before you get to 63, 64%, you'd have to go from disordered, which is liquid, to crystal with, sol with solid. The actual equilibrium point is 
you are liquid up to 49% and crystal above 54%. And then you should be crystal from there all the way to 74%. But somehow people found that when they got to this range, 58%, things didn't move around so freely and they said they had a glass. And that was results from computer simulations. Um, let's see what, I, what else I have here. So um, there's this beautiful experiment Okay, that was done by Pusey and Van Megan in, in the mid 80s, where they took colloids and they let, let them settle under gravity, similar to the experiment I showed you before, but looking at this phase diagram. Okay, and when they had less than 50%, over here you can just see it's cloudy. Over here, you have coexistence. You have crystal down there and liquid up here. More crystal, less liquid. More crystal, less liquid. Over here, it's completely crystalline, right? And then the funny thing is over here, you've got a crystal floating, which means it's less dense above a liquid, OK? And this is what they identified as a glass, OK? This is a great experiment, a really cool experiment and you know you learn a lot from it it gave you essentially pretty much what was what was predicted by the computer simulations by the best that people knew at the time the only problem with this experiment is it cost ten dollars okay and if you're in a physics department and all of your colleagues are doing you know particle physics and going to CERN and spending billions of dollars you don't get any respect if you've got a $10 experiment. So the question is, OK, how do I make this experiment more expensive, comparable to what these guys are paying, right? And there's an easy way. Send it into space, OK? This guy costs a half a billion dollars each time you launch it. This was in the days of the space shuttle, OK? So we sent up some experiments on the space shuttle, OK? And what we found is this was our sort of phase diagram, liquid over here. You see crystals forming. You see a dendritic growth over here. So you, they grow like snowflakes, which wasn't known before. And then as you go up, you go all the way up from 50% to almost 64% over here, no glass. So the one thing we found from this, well, we found several things from this. But one thing we found is that glass phase doesn't exist. The sample was returned to the Earth. You don't want to, if you want to make sure you had the right concentration and stuff, so you want to mix it up, let's say it returns as a, as a crystal. You want to mix it up and see whether it's still a glass. And you mix it up on Earth, and this is a stir bar, and the bottom of this tube is down here. And a year later, this is sitting here, which means it's rigid, which means it's not crystalline because it's clear essentially here. Here's the crystal that formed in space. Okay, and the crystalline space grows into the glass, which means it's the more stable phase here. Um, and so after that, this phase disappeared from the phase diagram and even from the simulation phase diagram, not because of the experiment, because they had better computers in the late 90s than they had in the 80s when they, when they were first doing these experiments. Okay, now, um, what I didn't tell you is that saying that FCC is the densest phase, okay, is a little bit of a cheat because there are many, many phases which have exactly the same density as FCC. The way you make a dense phase in one dimension is you make a line of particles. In two dimensions, you make two lines of particles, but you don't put one directly on top of the other. You put one in the inter interstices of the uh, l layer below it. And that gives you this hexagonal lattice over here, which is the densest packing in two dimensions. Now what you do is you say, OK, I'm going to stack these guys on top of one another. But I can do that by putting the next layer in that interstice or in this, inter well, in that one or in that one. OK? And these, where you place it, are given names, like this layer is called A. This layer is called C, this layer is B. The FCC structure is ABC, ABC, ABC. You can also do AB, AB, AB. That's another well-known structure. That's hexagonal close packed instead of face-centered cubic. Face-centered cubic is basically a cubic structure. Okay. The difference 
between these two is only two parts of a thousand. So the actual thermodynamically stable phase wasn't known at the time. So we went back to space. This was last year. And we got this. We did an experiment with a confocal microscope, which just lets you look into the sample. It lets you scan the sample and also look into the sample and get 3D information. We took a strip like this. That's the whole strip. Here I'm showing you images from this strip. They're stitched together, overlaid in these regions. It's a single crystal. You can see these lines going straight through like that. And when you unravel it by looking at many layers, so you can see the three-dimensional structure, you see that when you piece it together, you see this 111 face over here. It corresponds to this hexagonal face. Okay? And when you rotate it and take another cut, what you see is this image over here, which clearly has square symmetry. And that corresponds to this face of a cube or this face of the pile. And so we know from this experiment, this is sort of the biggest sing single crystal of colloids okay, that's ever been made. That's why I called it a monster. Well, I wasn't the only one that called it a monster. And it says that even though there's only 0.2% difference, the actual ground state for the system is the FCC crystal. And this is the first time that's shown. Let me get back to random packing. Because this problem is an old problem, and crystal packing is now completely solved, theoretically, and we know what the ground state is and everything else, it's still not really understood what this random phase is. And people, smart people, have done really cool experiments with this. One of them is Stephen Hales, okay, who is a botanist, okay, who studied how peas swelled, for example. And he did two experiments, one I could think of, one for the life of me, I'd never think of as much too clever for me, okay? One of them is you find out the packing fraction over here by filling your jar with peas, putting in water, and draining out the water. You measure how much water there is with and without the peas. You know how much room the peas took up, okay? Then what he did is he put this heavy lid on top of it, and he cooked it. And when you cook it, the peas swell. And when the peas swell, they make a border with the particles they touch. And that allows you to find the configuration of the cage around each particle and the number of nearest neighbors. And so I assigned, this was when I was at Princeton, I, I assigned an undergraduate to do this for his project, for his thesis project, undergraduate thesis project. And he tried it, and he couldn't get the peas to swell. Okay. So I talked with Sir Sam Edwards, who's you know, one of the top guys in the field of soft condensed matter, one of the founders of it. I said, what gives? The peas don't swell, because he's English, and these, this was done in England. He said, oh, don't you know that for the past couple hundred years, peas have been bred not to swell? Okay. So he said, I'm going to send you peas that you can do the experiment with. So he sent us the peas, and they didn't swell either. But the student. Didn't, wasn't stopped by that. He just used Israeli couscous. And here's what happens when you cook the Israeli couscous. And you drain out the water, and then you put ink back in. And what you find is what the peas look like is this. They have flattened faces with their neighbors over here. And some of them, not all of them, but some of them have faces which are pentagons. Okay, There's one which is a pentagon. There's one that's a pentagon. This one's a hexagon. But you have some pentagons thrown in there. And pentagons okay, have five-fold sy symmetry. And five-fold symmetry okay, is not allowed crystallographically. Why? Well, for one thing, if you have a lattice, okay, you have to have a point at the inverse. All of them have inversion symmetry. And you'll note, if I do this in two dimensions, for example, if I take that point and I find the inver inversion point, it should be over there. And it doesn't exist for a pentagon. For a hexagon, it will, but not for a pentagon. And seemingly, if I made something with only pentagonal faces, I would make an icosahedron. And this point should be on the other side, on the back face over there. And that doesn't exist either. OK? 
Okay? Um, so you can't have crystallographically um, a crystal with fivefold symmetry or a icosahedral symmetry in three dimensions. That led to uh, quasi crystals, which I'm not going to talk about because one of the inventors, Dove Levine, is sitting in the back row there, uh, was the inventor of quasi crystals. Okay, in any event, what, what does that mean? So the idea is if you start randomly packing things and you get things in an icosahedral configuration, you're going to frustrate the formation of any crystal. And that may be what frustrates in three dimensions, okay forming a crystal all the time, unless you prepare it specially. You have to prepare it specially. If you just pour the spheres in, they're going to go in randomly because they're frustrated. They can't crystallize if you have some of these icosahedra in there. Okay, now, so this random close packing, crystal close packing, we've decided, okay, thousands of years ago it was solved, and finally mathematically was solved a couple years ago. Random close packing, isn't solved yet, okay? And there's this paper that, which brought a lot of attention is random close packing of spheres well defined. Uh, Sal Torcato will come up in a little while. Um, so I was at a faculty party at Princeton and I happened to run into John Conway. John Conway is one of the best mathematicians in the latter half of the 20th century. He invented the game of life and stuff like that. I said he's an expert on sphere packing in any number of dimensions. I asked them, how come you don't work on random close packing? Because that's unsolved, okay? And what he said mathematici is mathematicians won't, won't touch the problem. And the reason is that some things that are random are well-defined. A random walk is well-defined. A random, you know, set, uh, random steps or random picking of particles out is well-defined. What it means is they're uncorrelated. The system is completely uncorrelated. It has no memory of what goes before. And what he said is, mathematicians won't touch the problem. Random is uncorrelated. Excluded volume, that is the fact that the spheres can't interpenetrate one another, gives you correlations. You know, you can't have two particles overlapping. The distance between them has to be set as the diameter of the particles. You can't get them closer together. That correlates the system. Anything else you want to say, doesn't matter because it's no longer random. I can't define it as random. And that's what's held the, the field up for, for a while. Now, one question that I've been aiming for, one of the big questions I've always been after, and as I explained to you, isn't known yet, is this question of whether you can ever find anything which, which, um, which that stacks more densely, randomly, than it does in a crystal, okay? And so the idea is, well, if I want to see whether this is true, that everything crystallizes, everything is more ordered in its ground state, okay? Um, I should try some examples. And the easiest example, if you want to deviate from spheres, is ellipsoids, okay? And the best pay, place to get monodispersed ellipsoids is from the Morse company in terms of M&Ms. So M&Ms look like this. They're identical to one another to better than half a percent, okay? They're all the same shape, okay? They're all the same size. Here is an, ellipso an ellipse around this projection, this cut of the M&M. For instance, if you choose Skittles, okay, they deviate by 3% or more. Um, and the reason I want to choose something that's ellipsoids because ellipsoids mathematicians have actually worked on and they can say something about it. So I gave this problem to another undergraduate. Okay, I said, why don't we find out the random close packing of M&Ms? Okay. So he did it, okay? He went and he measured it and he said, look, when I take regular M&Ms or mini M&Ms, okay, I get 0 0.67, 0 0.676, whatever. And for ball bearings, 0.64. So this is what spheres do. This was just to check that he'd get 
the well-known answer. And these guys are higher. So he says, OK, well, M&Ms pack more densely. That don't know, we don't know yet about that's random. We think it's random. We'd have to prove that it's random. But in any event, they pack denser than spheres. And I said, you're crazy. You're nuts. This isn't true. Mathematicians have proved it. And what mathematicians had actually proven oops, here we go, is the following, is that if you take this dense packing, this FCC packing over here, okay, and what you do is you take, if this is a program, and I just put my pointer over there and pull this down by the aspect ratio 1.91 to 1, which is the aspect ratio for M&Ms, so I just pull this side down like that, I get the densest packing of ellipsoids, and it's exactly the same as the densest packing of the spheres because I haven't changed the configuration, I haven't changed the number of particles, and the volume of an ellipsoid is four thirds, well, for a sphere, it's four thirds pi r cubed. For an ellipsoid, it's four thirds pi abc, where those are the axes, the principal axes. Okay, so if I change one of them, there's an oblate ellipsoid. I only change one of them. I have r squared times r over 1.91, almost a factor of 2. And I've changed my container by exactly the same amount. Volume fraction is the same. Proof that, you know, ellipsoids that are, this is a proof by mathematicians in the early 1900s that ellipsoids pack identically to spheres. Okay. So I went off to fire the student. Right, because he screwed up. Okay, and then I said, wait, before I do that, maybe I should look at it. And maybe it's different if it's random. Okay, and so I tried the same thing with my in my, what my imagination told me was a random packing, which looks like this. And when I pull the cursor down, I get something that looks like that. And you look at it for a little bit and you say, well, there's nothing wrong with this. This sort of looks okay, but this doesn't look right. And you look at it for a while, and finally you figure out what doesn't look right. What doesn't look right is, for example, if I look at this particle over here, which was um, this particle over here, which is this particle over here, okay, before I pull it down, this guy is clearly stable, right? It's held in place by those neighbors. But when I look at this guy, where there's some weight pushing down over here. I'm held in by these three, but there's some weight pushing down in here. So I have a torque on this particle, okay, which is unresolved. Okay? That is, if these are frictionless, this is just going to push the particle down into this hole. And so it's really different um, having spheres and having ellipsoids. And the difference is I have a degree of freedom here that I didn't have before. I can rotate the particle. I rotate the particle here, nothing happens. I wrote the particle, rotate the particle, I change the geometry. Okay? And one of the ways that this shows up, so this just emphasizes that point. Okay? You can all see that this doesn't look quite kosher. It doesn't look quite right. Okay? not stable. Okay, so it turns out, I said people don't know a lot about random packing. One of the things they know about packings like this, which is actually due to Maxwell, same Maxwell as the DNM, okay, is something that you learned in public school. Okay? What you learned in public school is if I have a certain number of variables that I have to solve for, I have to have the same number of equations as I have variables. Right? That will determine the problem. Then I can determine those variables, right? Well, where are you going to get equations in a pile of M&Ms or a pile of spheres? The only way you get equations is from contacts between them. So the contact, I can say, well, the posi this position and that position are related by this line that joins them together. And that can determine where, what are the, where the variables are. So the number of variables must equal the number of contacts. Okay, the number of contacts is the number of neighbors. Okay, this is for the whole system, the number of variables is the dimensionality times the number of particles. So for instance, it's D is three in three dimensions, two in two dimensions. But Z is times N over two because a contact involves two neighbors, one with the other. 
Okay? And so when I solve this, the number of neighbors is supposed to be 2D. Okay? So for spheres in 1D, you need two neighbors, which is obvious. Uh, in 2D, you need four neighbors on average. And in 3D, you need six. But for ellipsoids, for M&Ms, okay, they're ellipsoids of revolution, so there's a vector. And that vector has two angles that determine its orientation. Right? So I have two more degrees of freedom. I have five degrees of freedom. I have to multiply that by two. I have to get 10. And when the experiment was done, okay, we calculated. And the average number of contacts for the M&Ms was 10, 9.87, which is as close as we could get to it. Now, we want to see whether this is really disordered or not. So how do you see whether it's disordered or not? Well, you can look at it and you say it looks disordered. But that's not good enough. Okay? You have to find the 3D structure of this. And it's hard. You can't use a confocal microscope to look through a packet of M&Ms. So what you do, oops, um, I, I forgot to say something. So this, can, this, where you satisfy this condition, you have enough contacts to determine the variables, but just enough. Okay, so that's called isostatic. That's the minimum number you need to define it. Okay, um, and to understand what isostatic means, the easiest example is a chair which can move um, down, right, tip right and left, and tip forward and backwards. So that's three degrees of freedom. You need three legs. Two legs won't do. Four legs is too many. Okay, so isostatic would be three here. Okay, how do you know that it's not ordered? You want a 3D image of it. You go to the Princeton Hospital. You said, my head hurts. I need an MRI. You stick your head in. Guy goes out of the room. You put back in a bottle, you know, uh, your packing of M&Ms. And now you can see what the structure is. And you can look whether it's ordered and it's not ordered. And you can calculate even whether everything is aligned, okay? much less crystalline. OK, so that works. Um, let's see, how am I doing? I better speed up. OK, so you can now say, well, if, and with, if five degrees of freedom is good, six degrees is, is even better. So if I make a shape where the three axes, the ellipsoids, are, um, are different, then maybe I can get even a denser packing. And here's sort of what's predicted okay, for the packing fraction. It's getting up point, near 0.74 for that particular geometry. So we made these guys, OK? Ellipsoids, these are no longer by, uh, buying them from M&Ms. We used um, essentially our own version, because it wasn't easy. There weren't really good 3D printers at the time. For making this, we made a whole bunch of them. And we find that, found the packing of them. And they packed to 74.7%, better than um, better than you know the, the the spheres, better than the ellipses of revolution, and better than FCC crystals. Now, remember, I told you that it was proven by mathematicians, okay, that ellipsoids, the densest packing of ellipsoids, is the same as the densest packing of spheres. So what happens? It looks like we got something here. It looks like we got something that packs better randomly. Okay, then it does crystalline. Well, you shouldn't really trust um, mathematicians, okay? Because when mathematicians tell you they have a, a crystal, what they really mean is they have a lattice, okay? And crystals, as we know them, are not just lattice. Sometimes in each unit cell, I can have more than one object, whereas a lattice has exactly the same object in every unit cell. And in fact, uh, if you take an FCC structure like that, and instead of putting your ellipsoids down like that in this plane and the plane below it, you put them like this in the top plane, and you put them, I don't know whether you can see it, like that in the next plane. So you have these, and you put them perpendicular to one another. Then what you find is you get something that packs denser than spheres do. And it actually packs up to 77%. OK, so now the question is, is the ratio that we're using, how does it fit relative to this 
relative to what you get for different aspect ratios here? And the answer is the random packing, which we found at 74.7% 7, is beaten by an, by an ellipsoid with three different axes at 75.7. Um, okay, so as of now, there is nothing that packs better uh, randomly the, um, than crystalline, in actually in any dimension that I know of, but um, certainly for 3D. Okay, now I want to go, I still have 15 minutes left. Okay, so let's see where I can do this. Now I want to show you how I, we got this algorithm and what it does. So here is a, here is a, a demonstration by G.I. Taylor, master of, of hydrodynamics, um, who is going to demonstrate to you something which um, is really remarkable, um, that flow at low Reynolds number, that is flow that's very viscous and slow, in a viscous medium with a slow, with a slow motion, is time reversible. Now everybody knows that the laws of physics are time reversible. That means something else. That means if you play a movie one way and play a movie the other way, backwards, when you look at what goes on, it looks like the laws of physics are obeyed in both of them. But this is something different. This actually tells you that what happens for low Reynolds number, the time reversibility is that the movie plays backward, played backward is just the reverse of the movie played forward. And that means that the fluid element's motion is locked, is completely determined by the motion of the boundary. Okay? So what, what he does is in this video is he's got two concentric cylinders as shown over here. Okay? The inner one rotates, the outer one is static. He puts some ink in over here, right? And now what he's going to do is he's going to rotate it like that. Okay. And it looks like it's dissolving, right? Okay. And he's not taking really any care to go exactly the same speed. He's doing his finger, which doesn't go at the, right, at the same speed. To show that he's not just playing the movie backward, he moves his finger to the other side. He doesn't, you know, again, be very careful about the speed he's going as long as it's slow. And you see what happens is that it comes back. And that's really remarkable, okay? You will remember that movie the rest of your life, <laughs> okay? Um, okay, so low Reynolds number flow is reversible, is time reversible, okay? So the question that some of my colleagues had, Dave Pine and Jerry Golub, um, is, well, what happens if you put particles in? Does the same thing hold? So they said, well, let's just do the uh, G.I. Taylor, Taylor experiment again. We'll put particles in here, okay? We'll look at a few of them. Some of them will index match so you can't see them. They're invisible in the fluid. And some of them we'll be able to see. And we will just do the experiment where we go back and forth and change the amplitude of the back and forth motion. We can go all the way around and come all the way back or move it a small amount, okay? And now they're gonna look at it from the side and what they find is this and this are both movies. These are as a function of volume fraction and strain amplitude, that is how much you rotate it, the amplitude of the motion. And this guy clearly is not reversible, that is, it's a, this is a strobe movie, so you're taking a picture every cycle, and here they're not coming back. Okay, it would be like that ink spot was spreading out or occurred in different places. Whereas here, you can see there's some motion here, but pretty much every cycle they come back. So it looks like it's reversible here, but if you either make the density too high or the amplitude too high, it becomes non non-reversible, like that, not reversible. Okay, so when they measured it, they said, okay, what we find is a threshold here, and there's no diffusion effectively. Everything comes back to the same place. If you're below this strain amplitude for a particular volume fraction, 
and the diffusion is different in one direction and the other along the radial direction and tangential direction, but there's a real threshold that happens. Okay, so I made this model to try and understand it, and the model comes in because the model is very simple because I don't really know how to do hydrodynamics. What I imagined is I have particles in suspension, and I'm going to shear them, right? And they're going to come close to one another. And it turns out they never really are going to go like that because they can't penetrate one another. They're going to go around one another. But I'm going to say if I do an affine deformation, which means I just tilt everything like as shown over here, displace them according to these vectors. Okay, this one will go move further than that one. They'll collide over there. I don't know how to handle a collision. That's really hard. Okay, but what I'll do is I'll say, I'll suppose that it moves, and then when I come back to the original ones, when I go back to here, okay, so I've strained it, and now I bring it back, that's my cycle. I'll, I'll bring it back to the original spot, in other words, those two, but then I'll give each of them a random displacement, because I don't know where they're going to end up, okay? And that's what the model is. And then I just repeat and repeat. And so what's shown here is what happens in the simulation, which is similar to the first one that I've shown you, only here um, I'm showing you it's strobed, so in between what you're seeing, the particles are shearing and touching one another or not. And you see what happens over here. Well, these are particles, the blue ones in that cycle haven't touched anything else. Okay, they eventually get infected. Over here, the activity, which is the number of red particles, the one that have coll had coll collisions, okay, sort of stays active here. And over here, you see what happens is they die out. Okay, so something funny is going on. Okay, these guys continue. Okay, these guys die out. So what I did is I went to my computer and smacked it because I thought something was wrong, and they didn't start up again. And then I ran it again. And as soon as I ran it the second time, I said, oh, this is remarkable. What's happening is these guys, because they're moving around, have found positions such that when I shear them, they don't collide with anything. They've organized themselves. It's a problem of self-organization. Okay? And you might say, well, how do I know that this thing Okay, isn't going to find the same, you know, absorbing state as I have over here where everything stops. And the answer is because I can look. Oops, this thing isn't working now. Hmm. Well, it sometimes works. Uh, I can look at the activity as a function of the number of cycles. Okay, and here if I'm above the threshold, it's sort of goes down and then goes to some average steady state, whereas below the threshold it goes down to zero. And it turns out I can measure how long it takes to get to steady state or how long it takes to get to zero. And from either side of that transition, I find the divergence. And that's like critical slowing down for a thermodynamic phase transition. But this is a dynamical phase transition rather than a thermodynamical phase transition, right? But nonetheless, it's second order. Okay, because I can see it coming by the divergences. That's what defines the second order from first order. First order, you don't see it coming until, you have, until you're there, until you have it. Second order, you see it coming. Okay, okay. now I'm going to tell you something else. So I've, we've established now that for, shearing the part, that for shearing these particles, you have a transition between absorbing state and active state. Okay, now I'm going to introduce a new concept. This was done actually by Sal Torcado, who was one of the guys that I did the M&M's experiment with. And here's what hyperuniformity is about. Sal says, suppose I throw particles down in space, in a d-dimensional space, two, three, nine, whatever. I throw them down randomly. A Poisson distribution is a random distribution. I ask first, I now put a volume around them. I make a volume which encases these guys, an imaginary volume, okay, and I want to know the average number of particles inside, and that's easy. It's the density times the volume, okay? Now, and that means it goes like R to the D, as shown over here, right? R to the D, okay? The coefficient depends on what dimension you're in. Now he says, suppose I move it around, okay? The number inside is going to change, 
Okay? And so if I move this guy from here and I move it over here, as I move it around, I'm going to get fluctuations. Now, if it's random, it's Poisson distribution, we know the answer. The randomness is just the square root of n, right? Delta n, the randomness I'll get, is the square root of n. That means delta n squared, which is the variance, rather than the fluctuations, is just n, which goes like v, which goes like r to the d. So there are big fluctuations in the number inside as I move things around. Now the question is, can I do better than that? And everybody's immediately going to say, sure, you can do better than that. You make a crystal. Okay? And a crystal, you're going to say, well, it doesn't matter where I draw my circle. Okay? I'm going to have the same number of particles inside, and that is everybody's intuition, and it's wrong because as I move this circle around, sometimes this point is in the circle and sometimes it's out. So the variation in the get goes with the perimeter rather than the area, or it goes like r to the d minus 1. Okay? And that means that this thing, the variation is less than is there, but there's still some variation. There's always going to be some variation if you have points instead of just something that's uniform. What that corresponds to actually is that the structure factor, okay, um, goes to zero as Q goes to zero, as the wave vector goes to zero. It means that density fluctuations at large scale are reduced a lot, okay? Okay. And here's what one of those things looks like. This is disordered, right? It's clearly not completely disordered. You can sort of see that the spacing there between the particles is sort of, it's certainly not crystalline though, and it's also certainly not random, right? So this is sort of what a hyper-uniform structure looks like, okay? Now what does this have to do with what I was, anything I was telling you before? Dove Levine, who's sitting in the back of the room here, who is part of um, Mahesh's uh, conference last week, showed that at the critical point of this phase transition, so here this is for high shear amplitude, okay, you are active, this is the fraction of active particles, okay, you go to a steady state over here which is active, on the other hand, if the amplitude is low, so if I'm on a line over here, then as I go through several, many cycles, these guys arrange themselves until they're no longer colliding with one another, and I get an absorbing state. And exactly at the separatrix between here, which is the critical state for the system, what Dove found is that you're hyper-uniform. And this is not hyper-uniform. This is what you expect at a phase transition. Any regular thermodynamic phase transition has what's called critical opalescence, like the formation of clouds, right, which scatter light a lot because they have a whole range of different length scales in them just when you go from the gas phase to the liquid phase. That's called critical opalescence. And it's, it's, you know, disordered at all length scales here, okay? And what we found, what, what Dove found for these absorbing state phase transitions is that um, the long-range correlations, the long-range fluctuations die out. It becomes uniform. So we decided to test that. And our experiment, unlike the Kuwait's system, was a system where we wanted to be able to see what goes on with the colloids. So here are the colloids. They're in what's called a Conan plate geometry like that. That makes sure that the strain rate, that the strain actually, is the same over here as it over here because the amount that I'm going in, in angle into the blackboard over here is lower than there, but the distance I'm doing it is also lower. So the strain here and the strain here are the same. Conan plate geometry. This guy rotates, if I can get it to rotate. Oops, if I can get it to rotate like that. It's shaking because he took the movie with his camera so it was handheld. But, um, so you can do this experiment now and it rotate back and forth. And also look at with a microscope from the top. And he wants to find a way, okay, to find the critical point of this transition. That's hard to do. Okay? You have to usually take many samples around it to find out where it is. But he had a much cleverer idea. He said, suppose I start over here at a high strain rate, so I'm moving it a lot. It will be 
an active state, I will go to some steady state out here, I will do 400 cycles like that, so it's going to end up somewhere over here, okay? And then what I'll do is I'll lower the strain to here, and then I'll follow this curve. And after 400 cycles, I'll be somewhere over there. And then I do that again, and then I do it again, and as soon as I cross the separatrix over here, the first curve I hit on this side would be just below critical, and there they organize themselves, okay, and they don't move, right? They've organized themselves, and now they don't move anymore. And if I do anything less than that, they remain in that configuration. It's real, a real insight into what's going on. Okay, and this movie is, is just really cool. This shows you what this idea of the organization that you have by these collisions does. This is going to be, this is a picture, a confocal microscope picture of one plane in the sheared solution, okay? And again, it's going to be strobed, so it's going to go 400 cycles back and forth, okay? And then we take a picture, and then 400 cycles again with a slightly, a slightly lower strain, a slightly lower shear, okay? And what you'll see is this thing will move around because everything is active, but as soon as it crosses this line, which is the critical uh, strain, okay, it will stop. So watch, here it is. Every 400 cycles there's a picture, and now, boom, it just stops, right? And mind you, when it stops over there, it's still being sheared back and forth like that. It's just it's organized themselves to be, be below that threshold. And so now each time it does that, it repeats precisely. Okay, that's kind of neat. Okay, now one of the things, so one of the things that Dove predicted is that the system is hyper uniform, and that means the structure factor S of Q. Um, Goes, like a, goes to zero as Q goes to zero. In Dove's prediction, in the prediction of that model, the value of Q, okay, in S, the S of Q goes like Q to the alpha. I should have written that, there it is. S of Q goes to, like Q to the alpha, and alpha for three dimensions in this model is supposed to have a slope of 0.25. And you can see, if you're not at critical it doesn't have that. If you're critical, you have that. If you're above critical, it also doesn't have that slope. The critical value here is the yellow curve, and you can do it for different values of concentration, and when you get to critical, all of them collapse to that power law. So it looks like you have a system which is hyper-uniform. Okay, which is cool, so we found something out. Now, Sam, the student that did this experiment said, well, let's see it, whether I can fit it with the random organization model. And what he found out is his volume fractions that he was using were up to 40%. And in fact, you never get in random organization a volume fraction that's higher than 20%. Okay? So he said, well, maybe we should modify the model to be able to go to a higher density. And so what he did is, instead of any time particles overlap, okay, they move randomly. So this one takes a random step, this one takes a random step, not away from the other, it could be toward it, it could be orthogonal to it, but random. He said, let's replace that by a step where they actually separate from one another. That should allow us to organize better and go to a higher state. So he did that, and this is as a function of how much when they overlap, I give them a kick. I'm each giving them a kick. It could be a very big kick. It could be a very small kick. This is actually the size of the kick relative to the radius, okay? And what he finds is if I don't, if the kicks are random, I get this curve. If the kicks are directed away so the particles are separating, I get this. And this guy over here, extrapolates to 0 0.64. 0 0.64 woke us up. 0 0.64 is what I've been telling you about. That's random close packing, it looks like. So it looks like maybe we found something that goes there. Now you might say, okay, is it only when I do purely repulsive interaction? It turns out all you need is one of the steps out of a thousand 
is repulsive and the others are random and it still goes to 0.64, okay? And now you look at what other people have looked at. They've looked at structure factors, they've looked at the distance between particles that are not touching, the distribution of those, all of those fit um, with what people ha associate with random close packing, including the fact that as epsilon goes to zero, the number of contacts goes to six. And six is isostatic. And that's like jamming, okay? That's like what we found when, when we looked at, you know, the, the average coordination you need to be barely um, stable, okay? Um, well, I won't tell you much about this. This just says that when I look at other properties like critical slowing down and like how many active particles are there when I go past jamming, it falls in a particular universality class. That is, it fits in the class that random org and MANA does. So BRO is in the same universality class as random org was. Here is what happens when you now look at um, S of Q um, as a function for this biased random org, as we, as we call it, um, for different kick size. And as the kick size goes to zero, okay, um, actually for the critical value for any of these kick sizes, you find that the slope here is 0.25. But even at the, high, at the lowest kick size, which gives you the highest density, it's a, it's, the slope is 0.25, it's hyper-uniform, okay? And then you go over and you compare with what other people have measured for what they consider random close packing, okay? And these are two other models, and this is our model, and they fit right on top of one another, okay? And so we can now say, okay, let's propose that BRO is the thing that defines RCP. And can we learn anything from that? And one of the things we learn from it is that you get the answer that people have seen before for three dimensions, for four dimensions, for five dimensions. You find something different from what lots of people find. You find that there is no such thing as random close packing in 2D or in 1D, 1D is sort of trivial. 2D, it turns out when you do this, you get this hexagonal pattern, which is the densest packing, okay, in two dimensions, right? And it always goes there, it doesn't go random. And the interesting thing is we didn't tell this model that the ground state has to be ordered. And in fact, in three dimensions, it's not ordered. We didn't tell that it has to be disordered either. And in two dimensions, it's ordered. Right? So there's something going on here which is really interesting. Now, um, it turns out the, in, uh, in, in phase transition theory, there's something that's called the upper critical, um, the upper critical dimension, right? And what that means is above the fluctuations in the system, when you get above that dimension, the fluctuations are irrelevant. Okay, it's, you go to what's a mean field, okay? And that's what you expect when the number of neighbors you have, when you can average um, things over just your neighbors, and you can average things over your neighbors very well if the dimension is infinite, because then you have infinite number of neighbors, okay? And so the physics that you get from the upper critical dimension on is the same as the physics you get at infinite dimension. Okay, and it turns out for this universality class, okay, the um, upper critical dimension, which gives you mean field here, is four. Two is different, than, one is different than two, is different than three, but four out to infinity is the same, okay? And here is the fraction of active, the exponent for the fraction of active particles. This is what we get in this biased random organization model. In two dimensions, we get 0.64, what's predicted is 0.64. Three dimensions, we get 0.84. Four dimensions and above four and five dimensions, we get one. The same thing is true for the hyper-uniformity. The hyper-uniformity, okay, is um, for 
one dimension 0.41, well that way you don't have, for in two dimensions 0.45, three dimensions 0.25, four dimensions, it's not hyper uniform anymore, it's random. Okay? So one thing we found is if you do, if you look at random close packing, okay, if you go above four dimensions and above, all the way to infinity, it's random. Okay? It's not hyper-uniform. It's not density fluctuations going away. And that's sort of interesting because, and this is one thing I skipped over, which I shouldn't. Um, well, I'll, I'll get to it in a second, I guess, since I'm running out of time anyway. Okay. Uh, and this also shows that the um, number of, the number of touching neighbors goes like um, twice the dimension, right, in this model. Okay, I want to do that. Now, the one thing I forgot to tell you is why people are no, no longer care about selling fruit by the bushel, right? So why do they care about any of this now, okay? And people do care about this now. And they particularly care about what packing is like in high dimensions. And the reason is, in, if you want to do um, information theory, or if you want to transmit information, or you want to store information for communications, for computing, for whatever, okay, you want to store your information okay, as far away each piece of information, as far away from each other piece of information as you can so that noise doesn't confuse them, so that noise doesn't ruin the information you're trying to send. Okay? And typically the way that's done is by saying, okay, I'm going to write, let's say, an 8-bit word, and I want that 8-bit word to represent yes or no. Okay? And the way I'm going to do it is yes is going to be eight ones, and no is going to be eight zeros. And why, why do I do with eight? Why don't I do with one? Because if things are corrupt in the transmission, okay, I may, instead of having eight ones, only have seven ones or only six ones. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the majority rules, okay? So the larger I make my word there, the more certain I am that I'm protected against mistakes, against errors. It's error correcting. And then I want to make it that one eight ones is over here and eight zeros is as far away from that as I can get it. Okay? And that's why people nowadays are interested in packing problems. Okay, and they're interested in particular densest packing, because the densest packing gets your units as far away from them as you can get. Um, okay, so, uh, well, I guess, so I want to do is close this up, if I can, by showing you what's known about packing. Oh, one of the things is, uh, I should mention one other thing. So, if we shear the system in three, if we don't shear the system in three dimensions, we get random close packing. If we shear the system in three dimensions, we actually get an FCC crystal. Okay? So our dream, which almost certainly won't be true, is if we go to high dimensions and we do random and we do random organization BRO, what we're going to end up with is random close packing. And if we shear it, we're going to end up with the densest phase. And one of the problems with that is we don't know what the densest phases are. Um, in, if you look in higher dimensions, so this is from Conway's book um, on packing. Uh, so this is dimension, and this is what people suspect are the structures, okay, that are the densest. But the only thing that's known for sure is one, two, three, uh, four is not. This should have been one, two, three. It should st stop there. Eight and 24. Those guys are known exactly from work that, uh, that she did with, within the past two years or so. Okay? And all the rest is unknown. So all the rest is, is open for us to find out whether, whether we can get there or not. Okay. So um, what I've shown you through a lot, oops, and way over, um, is that it looks like this self-organization algorithm that we have, random 
uh, organization, can explain, uh, can give you um, RCP, can give you the properties of RCP in one, two, three, and now four and five dimensions at least, and maybe more, and that these other things which people put in in order to define the problem, so people sometimes to define random close packing, they put in that the system must be disordered, they put in that the system should be isotropic, they put in that the system should be isostatic, that is, have z is equal to twice the dimension you're in, that it's jammed, and that it's hyper-uniform, um, and these guys just spill out. The only thing we do is we say, we've got a model, we're looking for the highest density critical point in that dimension for this model, and the answer, these things are emergent properties then that come from that. Okay, and the real hero of all of this is Sam, who's over here, um, who sort of did the experiment to find that it was hyper-uniform, and then suggested that we should modify random organization to get that. And other people that are involved were Sal for the, um, for Paul and, and Weining and Sal for uh, looking at um, ellipsoids. Random organization was an experiment that was done by Dave Pine and Jerry Golub and later by Laurent and uh, John Royer. Dove is, as I say, back there. He showed that um, the systems were hyper uniform. Uh, and here's Sam again. Okay, thanks for your attention.